Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Today for Sabbath School, we have Greg and Mary. And today's lesson is Jacob the Supplanter. We're going to learn all about Jacob. But before we begin, Mary, could you pray? Definitely. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we're so very grateful for another Sabbath day that you have given us, an opportunity where we can spend some quality time with you, and we're inviting your Holy Spirit to be with us now to open our hearts and minds to your truths as we continue studying Genesis. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so Jacob the Surplanter. Last week we left off with... Uh, passing from the first patriarch, Abraham, and how both Isaac and Ishmael buried him, and how God had made it crystal clear that Isaac was the son of promise. So through Isaac is the lineage that will ultimately lead to the promise, the Savior, Jesus, the Messiah. Now we read in Genesis 25, verses 23 and 23, but the children struggled together within her, and she said, it is, or if it is so, why then am I this way? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, and this is Rachel, Isaac's wife. Um, I'm sorry, Rebecca, Isaac's wife. Um, the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples will be separated from your body, and one people will, shall be stronger than the other and the older shall serve the younger. So we see that promise that God has given Abraham and Isaac perpetuating now, and they're having kids, right? They're starting off pretty well, right? How long did it take for Rebecca to get pregnant? Well, it says that they were married when he was 40, and she gave birth when he was 60, so 20 years. So no concubines, no any of that. They're doing really good following God's instructions, right? Okay, so, and she gave birth, and we know that, and basically we see the conflict and the struggle literally for that firstborn right even before they're born. And we'll see in this week's lesson how the two brothers are, how they're actually, what their character and natures are. The older Esau we'll see how he's living for the moment, really. What, what is now, not what the future holds, but in the moment, literally. Neglecting the duties and responsibilities of being the eldest, because not only were they the firstborn with the birthright, they were also the spiritual leader, and, and literally they were supposed to be the patriarch. And he doesn't seem to want any of this. And then the younger Jacob, looking towards the future and developing the character of a leader of the household to be that patriarch. He's looking at the spiritual role as well. And we read Genesis 25, 27. When the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a peaceful man living in tents. Now, you see that word peaceful. Other, pe other versions um, might have content or things like that, but the Hebrew word is tame. And it's used in Psalms 37, 37 as a blameless man, and Job 8, 20 as integrity, that same word, and in Job 9, 22 as the guiltless. It doesn't sound like a surplanter yet, does it? He doesn't sound like the deceiver that he has that reputation. It sounds like he is trying to be the heir of promise, there's just one little problem. He's second born. We will cover in the lesson today the lentil stool, stew that was um, bought the birthright, and we're going to hear about that later, so I don't want to steal anyone's thunder. And we're going to show how little that birthright really mattered to Esau. But let me ask you, do you think that Esau and Jacob knew about um, the Lord, what it told his mother or their mothers? Or and basically about the older serving the younger, we will see how Jacob is still lacking one very important characteristic, trusting in the Lord completely. It continues when Rebekah discovers that Isaac is going to bless Esau. Genesis 27, 11 through 13. Jacob answered his mother Rebekah, Behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, 
and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me. Then I will be as a deceiver in his sight, and I will bring upon myself a curse and not a blessing. But his mother said to him, Your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go get them for me. So Rebecca knows that Esau is going to get the blessing. And she desperately does not want this to happen. And we're going to see just the price that she pays for it. If only we could see the byproducts of sin before we commit it. If Rebecca realized that after this, after Jacob leaves, she would never see him again. He would be with her, literally her brother for 20 years serving him and literally atoning for his sin. If Jacob realized the same, that he'd never see his mother again and just what he would have to go through, perhaps they might have made different decisions. So they prepare the meal and record speed and begin the grand deception. Genesis 27, 20 says, Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have, have it so quickly, my son? And he said, that's Jacob, because the Lord your God caused it to happen to me, even bringing the Lord into his deception. Now Jacob is showing his true supplanting potential. That's incredible. And after the deception is discovered, Esau said, and this is our memory verse for this week, Genesis 27, 36, then he said, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? Esau, let's just put it in today's terms, he's about to get ready to go ballistic. Because in his eyes, Jacob has taken everything from him. That same problem is still arising, though. We see this throughout Genesis. Somehow, we think God needs our help to fulfill what he says. But we don't have that problem today, right? No, no. How things never change. But God has plans for Jacob, just like he did for Moses with the 40 years in Midian. The wandering of the Israelites and the desert for 40 years as well, or when David was being pursued by Saul. All of these times, you see God working on characters, God teaching people, God molding people into something different from what they were. And we are going to see this with Jacob. God needs to show him what it feels like to have the shoe on the other foot, how much damage Jacob has caused, and how to trust the Lord completely so that he can become that spiritual leader for his family, become that patriarch. This will be, he is the, the patriarch of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now we don't have the complete journey of Jacob in today's lesson, but we see God forming the building blocks of that patriarch that will someday be known as Israel. In Genesis 32, 28b, the verse says, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. We're going to see that Jacob, but the f initial formation. We're going to see God mold him, but he's not complete until next week's lesson. So Mary, can you tell us about Sunday's lesson, Jacob and Esau? I certainly will. Thank you, Brian, for um, going ahead and doing such a wonderful job of summarizing everything for us. And today's lesson covers the last half of Genesis 25, starting at verse 27, which introduces us to Jacob and Esau, as Byron said. We'll compare the personalities of these two men and identify the qualities of Jacob that predisposed him to receive Isaac's blessing. So as we've mentioned, Isaac married Rebecca. It took her 20 years, and the Lord finally blessed her with a child. And while she's pregnant, she's wondering, what is happening? There's a struggle in my womb. 
And the Lord says in Genesis 25, 23, two nations are in your womb, two people shall be separated from your body, one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So the Lord tells her they're twins, and the contrast between the brothers appears at their birth from the beginning, signifying their respective destinies. The first son, Esau, is described by his appearance. He is red and hairy all over. The other son, Jacob, is described by his action. He grabs his brother's heel, which in Hebrew is akeb, hence the name Yahakob, Jacob, which anticipates Jacob's future act of supplanting his brother. Further contrast between the two brothers is clearly fulfilled in their behavior and choices. In verse 27 of Genesis, it states, So the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a mild man, dwelling in tents. So Esau was a cunning hunter, a man who loved to be outdoors in the fields. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 177, we're told that he grew up loving self-gratification and centering all his interest in the present. Impatient of restraint, he delighted in the wild freedom of the chase and early chose the life of a hunter. But Jacob was a mild, meditative man who preferred dwelling in tents. And as Byron said, that word mild was used for Job um, to mean blameless and also for Noah as perfect. So this is a kind of characteristic that Jacob has. And again, in Patriarchs and Prophets, it says that he was thoughtful, diligent, and careful, ever thinking more of the future than the present, content to dwell at home, occupied in the care of the flocks and tillage of the soil. So these two are growing into two nations, two different peoples. Another difference between the two is noted in verse 28 of chapter 25. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So keep this in mind as we're going to come back to this. Let's fast forward some years. The boys are now men. And there is an incident with the meal and selling the birthright. Esau comes back from hunting and is famished. Jacob is cooking red lentils, and Esau loves self-gratification, centered on the present, asks Jacob for food. Jacob immediately takes advantage of the opportunity and offers to satisfy his brother's request. However, there's a price. He asked Esau to sell his birthright to him this day, meaning right now. So before we move on, let's talk about this birthright. What is it? Well, it contained the promises that God made to Abraham and Isaac and were highly regarded by Isaac and Rebekah as the great object of their hopes and desires. The twins were taught to regard this with great importance, not only because it included an inheritance of worldly wealth, but because of the spiritual preeminence connected to the birthright blessing. There's, there were obligations resting on the possessor of the birthright, such as devoting his life to the service of God, and he must be obedient to the divine requirements, just as Abraham was. In everything, the will of God was to be consulted. And lastly, this birthright was only given to one child, usually the firstborn, and he who received it would be the priest of the family, and in his line of descendants, the redeemer of the world would come. So with this in mind, let's go back to the story. Is Esau so desperate to eat that he would give up his precious gift? Let's read Genesis chapter 25, verses 32 to 34. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? He implies that the immediate visible and physical enjoyment of food this day right now is more important than the future blessing associated with his birthright. Then Jacob said, swear to me of this day. 
Now Esau's confirming the transaction with an oath. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob, and Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. In selling the birthright, we see other contrasting characteristics. Esau is, pres is present-oriented and doesn't care about what could take place after death. Jacob is future-oriented and particularly sensitive to spiritual values. He uses material means to secure the birthright. Esau's request suggests that for him, the birthright had no spiritual value or significance. He was concerned only with his immediate gratification. Thus, he despised his birthright. Jacob has enough faith to see spiritual values and the future profit of a birthright, but not enough faith to trust God for it. In chapter 27, Rebecca, who loved Jacob, talks Jacob into using deception to obtain the birthright blessing, which Isaac, who loved Esau, desired to secretly bestow upon Esau. The results of this deception were tragic. And please take time to read Genesis 27 in detail, and I'd suggest also chapter 16 and Patriarchs and Prophets. So in closing, why was Jacob chosen to receive the blessings of God and not Esau? Could it have anything to do with the different disposition and attitudes of the two brothers? Could their hearts' attitudes toward God be what determined God's ability to work through them? Patriarchs and Prophets, page 178 says, But Esau had no love for devotion, no inclination to a religious life. The requirements that accompanied the spiritual birthright were an unwelcome and even hateful restraint to him. While Jacob, with secret longing, listened to all that his father told concerning the spiritual birthright, he carefully treasured what he had learned from his mother. Day and night, the subject occupied his thoughts until it became the absorbing interest of his life. Jacob was predisposed to receive God's blessings because he chose to know God and to trust him. And that's the important lesson for us to learn today, Byron. Thank you. All right, Greg, Monday, Jacob's Ladder. Jacob's Ladder. I love this part. It is, it's, it's a wonderful lesson. And what we're going to do is Mary had left off talking about um, Esau losing or selling his birthright. But he also sold, well, he didn't sell, he was deceived about receiving the blessing. So at this point here, what we're going to start today is Esau learned that Jacob had deceived him and his father and had received his blessings. In fact, if we go to Genesis 27, 36, it says, And Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob, for he has supplanted me these two times? He took away my birthright, and now look, he has taken away my blessing. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? So if we look at what does that verb mean to be supplanted? In the Hebrew, the verb is called alkab. And in general, it means to come from behind, hence the heel. However, in the Hebrew lexicon, I like how they do this. They state that specifically in Genesis Chapter 27, verse 36, it specifically means to circumvent or to defraud. And defraud is a very, very heavy term. So it's very specific to this. Now, as we go down in Genesis chapter 27, we just read verse 36. We'll go to verse 42. And this is where we read that he wants to kill Jacob. So verse 42 says, And the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob her younger son, and said to him, Surely your brother Esau comforts himself concerning you by intending to kill you. So Esau now hates Jacob, who is his twin brother, and now wants to kill him. But meanwhile, Rebekah, his mother, is worried and wants to prevent this kind of crime 
to happen, which would be fatal to both sons. So as we go to the next verse in Genesis 27, verse 43, Rebekah tells Jacob to flee to her brother Laban in Haram. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to my brother Laban in Haran. In the very next chapter, chapter 28 of Genesis, verse 5, Isaac tells Jacob to flee also to Rebekah's brother Laban in Padan Aram. Now Padan Aram is actually Mesopotamia, and Haram is a city in Mesopotamia. So that hopefully just gives you a little bit of a perspective there. They were both telling, both Isaac and Rebekah were telling Jacob to flee to her brother in Mesopotamia in the city of Haram. And do you guys happen to know what the distance is from where um, Jacob, it's, it's quite a bit. It's 457 miles. And that's not with taking a train, a bus. That's a track. Not even a skateboard. That is walking. That is a long time. Shoes. I hope so too. But they, they mentioned for him to stay there a few days until his brother's fury turns away. A few days. But as we know in reading and what's been mentioned, it turned out to be 20 years. Sound familiar? So now we're going to turn our attention to the bulk or to the meat of Thursday's lesson. So we'll turn to Genesis chapter 28 and verses 10 to 11. This brings us into Jacob's rest at night. This is during his exile on his way to Haran. So again, Genesis 28 verses 10 through 11. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. And the very next verse brings us to Jacob's dream. And that is verse 12. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the word set up, it's actually a verb, set up, is natsab, and that means to say, station oneself, to take one's stand for definite purpose. So let me ask you this. Who or what does the latter represent in the vision? Well, it represents Jesus. Jesus is stationing himself, taking his stand for definite purpose. Jesus is the link between heaven and earth. Jesus is the connection between heaven and earth, between humanity and the heavenly host. And the angels of God are descending and descending on it. And so what do angels of God do? Well, angels of God, they minister to God, right? So if they're ascending and descending on the ladder between heaven and earth, Jesus is showing Jacob and us today that there are angels ascending and descending to minister for him and for us today. And that you can also refer to as far as angels um, and what they do and how they work on our behalf, referring to Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. We don't have that on the screen. I'm not going to read it right now for the sake of time, but that will tell you about um, a little bit about what the angels do, do for us. Then the lesson also makes a point to compare the Tower of Babel to the Ladder of Bethel. And the Tower of Babel was built by man not to reach God, but rather to reach the heavens above the clouds because they either rejected God in total or they didn't trust God that he wouldn't flood the world again. And their motivation was self-preservation and to draw attention and acclamation to themselves, not to glorify God. On the other hand, the latter in the vision at Bethel represents Jesus as the connection between heaven and earth with ministering angels on Jacob's behalf and on our behalf. One is man's attempt to glorify self, and the other is God's unselfish love towards Jacob and humanity. Now we're going to go to verses 13 through 15, which tells us what the Lord said to Jacob in this dream. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, and the land which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. 
all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, this is so wonderful. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. So, does this sound like confrontation with God? Or does it sound more like encouragement and assurance from God? God knew that Jacob participated in the deception of his brother and his father, but God also knew the heart of Jacob and Jacob's desires. And we could get a little further insight. I'm going to read this real quickly out of Patriarchs and Prophets, page 178. Jacob had learned from his mother of the divine intimation that the birthright should fall to him, and he was filled with an unspeakable desire for the privilege that it would confer. Mary covered the meaning of that. It was not the possession of his father's wealth that he craved. The spiritual birthright was the object of his longing to commune with God as did righteous Abraham. So that was Jacob's motivation. God knew his heart. That's why he was assuring him. Then verses 16 through 22 tells us Jacob's response to the Lord and what the Lord had told him. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he put at his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of the place Bethel, but the name of the city had been Luz previously. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. So, It sounds to me as perhaps this may be the beginning of a personal experience with the Lord that Jacob had been seeking. Rather than God turning away from Jacob, the Lord was encouraging and assuring Jacob to go forward and that he would be with him. And in turn, Jacob responds with such gratitude that he anoints the stone that he laid at his head and he decides to give a tenth of the blessing that God gives, not in order to obtain blessing, but because of God's blessing that he had been given. So keep in mind that the tithing as giving thanks to God for the blessings he provides was an idea that had been given long before the rise of the nation of Israel. So in closing, my closing statement is this. What are some of the key takeaways that you take away from this? Perhaps it was the beginning of a turning point in Jacob's life life to trust in God's voice, to learn from his mistakes, and to walk in faith with the Lord, and that God will never leave nor forsake us if we are seeking him. Do you believe those lessons are meant for us as well? Oh, yeah. Especially after the deception, Jacob had feared that God had abandoned him. And that was just, that was God saying, you haven't gone that far yet. Because I have more mercy than you know. Right, I know your heart. I've got to work with you. Right. And he was willing. Mold him. Yes. Amen. Amen. So let's look at Tuesday. Deceive the deceiver deceived. Oh boy. <clears throat> so let's start off reading Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 188. And it reads, With the new and abiding faith and the divine promises, and assured of the presence and guardianship of heavenly angels, Jacob pursued his journey to the land of the children of the east. That's Genesis 29 and 1. um, But how different his arrival was from that of Abraham's messenger nine or or nearly a hundred years before. The servant had come with the train of attendants riding upon camels and with rich gifts of gold and silver. The son was a lonely, footsore traveler with no possessions save his staff. Like Abraham's servant, Jacob tarried beside a well. And it was here that he met Rachel, Laban's younger daughter. It was Jacob now who rendered service. 
rolling the stone from the well and watering the flocks. On making known his kinship, he was welcomed to the home of Laban, though he came portionless and unattended. A few weeks showed the worth of his diligence and skill, and he was urged to tarry. It was arranged that he should render Laban sir, our seven years' service for the hand of Rachel. So finally, it appears that Jacob's troubles are behind him, right? He might be penniless, but he has escaped Esau's wrath. He's realized that God has not abandoned him, and now he's found the love of his life. Oh, things are looking up. Many people look at Jacob <clears throat> as a timid homebody, but this is not the case. We see him moving the cover stone of the well by himself. That's no easy task. He might not be as burly as Esau, but he's definitely no wimp. He even stays with the family for one month and gets to know Rachel even better. Now Genesis 9, or 29, 18 through 20. Now Jacob loved Rachel. So he said, I will serve seven years for the younger daughter, Rachel. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than to give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed uh, to him but a few days because of his love for her. So seven long years. Think of that. If you made $50,000 a year, right? <clears throat> you just paid $350,000 for a bride. Wow. <laughs> that must be love. So now the big days come, right? Jacob has waited patiently for the love all this time for his love. And what happens? We read Genesis 29, verses 23 through 28. Now in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her um, to him. And Jacob went into her. Laban also gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a maid. So it came about in the morning that, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? Oh, well, let's remember that word, deceived. But Laban said, It is not the practice in our place to marry off the younger before the firstborn. Sure it's not. Complete the week of, uh, with this one, and we will give you the other also for the service which you shall serve with me for another seven years. Oh, the supplanter has been supplanted by a professional. Jacob did so and completed her week and gave him his daughter Rachel as his wife. Now, I have no idea how Re Jacob didn't know it was Leah, or more so it wasn't Rachel, right? Maybe she never spoke or something. I have to wait for the video in heaven on that one. But Jacob has been officially deceived by a master deceiver. Now he knows how his father felt. In Genesis twenty-seven thirty-three, after his deception, when Esau does actually come, Isaac says, And Isaac trembled violently. And said, who was he then that hunted game and brought it to me so that I ate of all of it before you came and blessed him? Yes, and he shall be blessed. But I love that Isaac trembled violently just from the shock of what his son had done. And now Jacob knows what it feels like. Let's go one further, even with Laban's daughters basically are used in the deception, and they know it. When Rachel is told that she is not meeting Jacob on their wedding night, it must have happened at some point in time, when Leah is told to go to a man that she knows doesn't love her, oh boy, this guy is a piece of work. Telling Jacob to stay with Leah for the rest of the week, and then you can have Rachel as promised to you, literally going from sister to sister, that's even worse. And Laban's daughters despise him so much. It's out of it, but in Gen it's a little farther ahead, but in Genesis 31, 14, and 15, this is when they're leaving to go to Canaan. And Rachel and Leah said to him, that's Jacob, 
Do we still have any portion or, or inheritance in our Father's house? Are we not reckoned by him as foreigners? For he has sold us and has also entirely consumed our purchase price. Finally, Jacob is listening to the true source of wisdom, though, and we're going to see this, that he's trusting in God because even though he's been wronged, he's actually doing the right thing. Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 90, 190. For 20 years, Jacob remained in Mesopotamia, laboring in the service of Laban, who, disregarding the ties of kinship, was bent upon securing to himself all the benefits of their connection. Fourteen years of toil he demanded for his two daughters, and during the remaining period, Jacob's wages were ten times changed. Yet Jacob's service was diligent and faithful. His words to Laban in their last interview vividly describe the untiring vigilance which he had given to the interest of his exacting master. This twenty years you have been with thee, me, thee thy ewes and thy she-goats have not cast their young, and the rams of thy flock have I not eaten. That which was torn of beast I brought not unto thee. I bear the loss of it. Of my hand didst thou require it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. Thus I was, and the day the drought consumed me, and the frost by night, and my sleep departed from my eyes. That's not an easy life. Not even remotely. And so he did the right thing, even though time after time, because what does the Bible say? Vengeance is, saith the Lord. So we hear a lot of phrases in the world today. Karma, even though it's from East Indian origins, but, you know, karma, what goes around comes around. We used the shoe on the other foot earlier. In the lesson, it is echoed by God himself with an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, that compensation. Jacob got what he had coming by that standard. And the deceiver had been shown the real damage that he had done by experiencing it himself. Jacob's deceiving days are done, though. Have you ever been there? Had God, or has God had to teach you by experiencing the damage that you've inflicted on others? God, Jesus put it so perfectly in Matthew 22, 37 through 39, and he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And who's our neighbor? Everyone. So it's a valuable lesson for Jacob. It's a valuable lesson for us. Mary, can you tell us about the blessing of the family? Yes, I will gladly share that. And what a family this was. So today's section covers Genesis 29, verse 31, all the way into chapter 30, verse 22, which focuses on Jacob's family. And for Jacob, the last seven years of his exile are the most burdensome. However, during this time, he fathers 11 children who will become the ancestors of God's people. This section is the center of Jacob's story. And it begins and ends with a key phrase, opened her womb. God allowed conception. In Genesis 29:31, it refers to Leah, and in Genesis 30:22 to Rachel. Births follow this statement each time it's written, evidence that the births are a result of God's miraculous action. So since it's a long passage, we'll just read a few key verses and I'll summarize the rest. So let's start with Genesis 29:31. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So earlier we studied the contrast between two brothers, and early on in this story we see a contrast between two sisters. 
Leah was unloved. Now, this word unloved could be translated also as loved in a much less degree. Now, why would this be? Well, the pen of inspiration states that when Jacob realized the deception that had been practiced upon him and that Leah had acted her part in deceiving him, he could not love Leah. So her actions had unintended consequences where he found it hard to love her. On the other hand, in Genesis 29, 18, we read, and Jacob loved Rachel. So let's continue. Genesis 29, 32 to 35, Leah gives birth to four sons because we just read that the Lord opened her womb. The first son is Reuben, which means to see. She says, God saw that she was unloved by Jacob. The second son is Simeon, which means heard, because God heard that she was less loved and heard the humiliation of her pain. Levi is the third son, which signifies attached. Leah is hoping that now her husband will be attached to her. Her fourth son is Judah, which signifies praise. Now she focuses on praising God for his grace. Genesis 30, 1 to 8, introduces us to another contrast between the sisters. Rachel has no children and begins to envy her sister Leah, who has given birth to four sons. So Rachel demands children from Jacob, and she tells him if she doesn't get them, she'll die. Jacob gets angry at her and reminds her that he's not God and he can't open her womb. So Rachel gives Jacob her handmaid Bilhah to have a child on Rachel's behalf. Does this sound familiar? Bilhah gives birth to two sons. The first one is Dan, which means judge. She feels God has judged her and given her a son. The second son is Nephtali, which signifies my wrestling. She wrestled with her sister and prevailed. Genesis 30, 9 to 13. Now this family uh, working is just really going to go off right here. So Leah realizes she can no longer conceive, so she gives her handmaid Zilpah to Jacob. And through her, two more sons are born, Gad, which means troop or good fortune, and Asher, which means happy because she's blessed. Now, Genesis 30, 14 to 16. Now it takes another turn. Reuben finds mandrakes and brings them to Leah, his mother. Mandrakes are a plant with a deep root, thought to have fertility-producing powers. Rachel asks for them, and Leah replies no, because Jacob was her husband first, and Rachel has stolen him and his love from her. So why should she steal her son's mandrakes too? Desperate for anything that will help her conceive, Rachel gives Leah permission to sleep with Jacob that night. When Jacob came in from the field later that day, Leah demands Jacob sleep with her because she has hired him with her son's mandrakes. Verse 17 says that God listened to Leah, and she conceived a fifth son, Issachar, which means reward. She felt God rewarded her with another son. In verse 17, Leah conceives again a sixth son, Zebulun, which means honor. Sometime later, she gave birth to a daughter, Dinah. In our last verse 22, we read, Then God remembered Rachel and listened to her and opened her womb. God never forgot Rachel. He was mindful of her. Fourteen years had gone by since she first laid eyes on Jacob. And now God healed her infertility and blessed her with a son whom she named Joseph, which means, May he add to me another son. 
which God later does by blessing her with Benjamin. So how are we to understand the meaning of everything that takes place here? In their biblical record, that did God want Jacob to have two wives and two surrogates? Yet God blessed Jacob with 12 sons who became the heads of 12 tribes. Was it God's design or purpose? Or did God work through with what he knew people would do? Jacob had family history of a conflict when a wife suggested that her husband take a surrogate to give her children. Wasn't that family history helpful to him? Was it God's will for Rachel to seek a surrogate? And what was Rachel's motive? Do you see God, godly love in action between the sisters? Is this history the outworking of God, that what God wanted them to do, or a revelation of how gracious God is and how he works with them where they are to bring them about to his plan despite what they're doing? And what is his plan? To restore us to righteousness, eliminate sin from us, which required Jesus to come. And thus, in Jacob's life, God was working with those people to keep open the avenue for Messiah to be born, while simultaneously seeking to deliver them from self-dependence to God-dependence. Praise God for his grace, and may we become God-dependent. Amen. I love how God can take a mess and turn it into something so much better. Amen. Amen. Greg, tell us about Jacob leaving. He's finally had enough. I sure will. And you know what I just noticed? The three of us wear glasses. Yes? Yeah. And, and I'll also <laughs> add this. I, I love everything that you guys have put together for this week's lesson, but actually I feel like I had the more interesting days. <laughs> and so if you look at Tuesday's lesson, I'm sorry, Monday's lesson was um, Jacob is fleeing to Haran. And here Thursday's lessons is Jacob leaves. So I get him coming and going. But there's some very, very important lessons and principles that I think the Lord is really teaching us. So um, Thursday's lesson is titled Jacob Leaves. And it's focused on Jacob fleeing Laban, who is living in Haran. And now uh, Jacob our attention turns to Jacob wanting to leave Laban and return back to his home country, which is Canaan. And as you know, Jacob has already faithfully served Laban, despite his deceptions, for 14 years and is about to work for him for another six years for a total of 20 years. And at that time, he will leave with his wives and his children. So let's take a look at what's going on here at this time. And if we turn our Bibles to Genesis chapter 30, and we're going to look at tw uh, verses 25 through 32. So I'm going to read these and just follow along with me. And it came to pass when Rachel had born Joseph that Jacob said to Laban, send me away that I may go to my own place and to my country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you and let me go. For you know my service which I have done for you. And Laban said to, said to him, Please stay if I have found favor in your eyes, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. Interesting. Then he said, name me your wages and I will give it. So Jacob said to him, you know how I have served you and how your livestock has been with me. For what you had before I came was little and it has increased to a great amount. The Lord has blessed you since my coming. And now... When I, and now, when shall I also provide for my own house? So he's concerned, when should I provide for my own house? I've worked for you all these years. So he said, what shall I give you? And Jacob said, you shall not give me anything. If you will do this one thing for me, I will again feed and keep your flocks. Let me pass through your flocks today, removing from there all the speckled and spotted sheep and all the brown ones among the lambs and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and these shall be my wages. So what's happening here? Jacob has fulfilled his time of 14 years, and Laban has proposed that Jacob stay and work for him, 
and but again Jacob wants to go back to his home country and Laban doesn't want him to leave so he offers Jacob wages and whatever he wants he says he'll pay so Jacob responds not by taking any wages but by offering to work for Laban again for another six years by feeding and keeping his flocks separating all the spotted and speckled in the brown sheet as we had just read Laban agrees to this and then sorry Laban agrees to this and he has his sons put three days separation between Laban's flocks and Jacob's flocks hmm. what a guy so if we look then at verses 37 through 43 we're not going to read these right now but it tells us that Jacob took rods of poplar almond and chestnut trees he peeled them and set them in the watering troughs where the flocks came to drink when the stronger livestock conceived he placed the rods in the troughs and the flocks brought forth streaked speckled and spotted offspring but when the feebler livestock conceived he didn't place the rods in the troughs so the feebler stock were Laban's and the stronger were Jacob's what's interesting is this and I, I want to give credit to Dr. Tim Jennings in a piece of research that he provided that I, I wanted to share with you and this is recent research it comes from let's see the title is the role of the prenatal nutrition on epigenetics for fur color that was produced in biology 2008 there is a gene and it's called the agouti gene that determines the color and of an animal's fur if it is turned on in some cells of the body and off in others, the fur of the animal will be speckled, spotted, or striped. What affects the expression of this gene? You'll take a guess. The branches, the almond branches and all that. Right. right. The and diet. The right. The diet of the mother. Right. Okay. So this is fantastic. This is amazing information that we get insight from that God obviously had inspired uh, Jacob with this information because otherwise how else would he know and it says here that recent research has documented that the branches of the trees chosen by Jacob do in fact provide the nutrients needed to alter the expression of the agouti gene which does in turn alter the color of the lambs that are born so I wanted just to share that with you but as we go through the lesson the lesson further down states that the lesson states that Jacob's unnatural compliance with Laban suggests that Jacob perhaps changed and I would agree with that however I I would have phrased it a little differently and that Jacob was learning his lesson Byron you had pointed that out in the prior lesson Jacob was learning his lesson about deception by being on the receiving side which humbled him and allowed him to serve Laban with patience humbleness humility because Jacob was being changed by exercising his newfound faith in God when 14 years earlier God came to him in vision at Bethel and renewed that same covenant with Jacob as he did with Abraham and Isaac so without question Jacob has been or is being changed and God is allowing the lessons to take place in his life so he really understands what he did and where he came from so God changes us if we're willing to be changed and it sounds like God was preparing Jacob to leave but Jacob's faith would not allow him to leave until God told him so so that takes us to the next chapter in the final part of this lesson so we're going to keep moving forward and going to Genesis chapter 31 and see how God continues to lead Jacob so let's read Genesis 31 1 through 13 so please follow along with me now Jacob heard the words of Laban's son saying Jacob has taken away all that was our father's and what was our father's he's acquired for all his wealth and Jacob saw the countenance of Laban and indeed it was not favorable toward him as before then the Lord said to Jacob return to the land of your fathers to your family and I will be with you so Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field to his flocks and said to them I see your father's countenance and that is not favorable towards me as before but the God of my father has been with me see that's faith that he's expressing there he's stating it and living that and um, uh, speaking that to he her. still has to worry about Esau amen that's still you know over uh, his shoulder come, right you bet and you know that 
with all my might, I have served your father, is what he says. Yet your father has deceived me and changed my wages 10 times, but God did not allow him to hurt me. If he says thus, the speckled sheep shall be your wages, then all the flocks bore speckled. And if he said thus, the streaked shall be your wages, then all the flocks bore streaked. So God has taken away the livestock of your father and has given them to me. And then verse 10, and it happened at that time when the flocks conceived that I lifted my eyes and saw in a dream. So this is another dream that Jacob is having where God is coming to him. And pay attention to these words that we're going to cover here because this is real significant. So I lifted my eyes and saw in a dream and behold the rams which leaped upon the flocks were streaked, speckled, and gray spotted. Then the angel of God not an angel of God, the angel of God spoke to me in a dream saying, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, lift your eyes now and see all the rams which leap on the flocks are streaked, speckled, and gray spotted, for I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land and return to the land of your family. So these verses say it all. Jacob hears God's voice, and by trusting God, Jacob by faith responds to the call of action to leave that land and return to the land of his family. And you think about this. What a journey this has been for Jacob, full of deceptions, trials, tribulations, but also growth in his faith because Jacob was willing. He was willing to let God lead him. Isn't that the same lesson for us today? If we are willing to let God lead our lives and put our trust and faith in him as Jacob did, we too will be changed. If we do so, as we know, God will never leave us nor forsake us. So that's Amen. Thursday's lesson. Do you have any final thoughts? I just see Jacob's life reflects each of our lives. We all go through trials and tribulations because of our own selfishness. But God can lead us. How do we react to it? That's exactly. It. Amen. Amen. Mary? Um, my final thought is just we can see the two choices that people have in life. Do you want to seek God and let him help you make choices? Or do you want to go off on your own and make choices? And so it's important what choice we make to choose to know God and to trust him. Amen. Amen. I want to read something from The Story of Redemption, page 88, Ellen White. <clears throat> Rebecca was acquainted with Isaac's partiality for Esau and was, sad and was satisfied that reasoning would not change his purpose. Instead of trusting in God, the disposer of events, she manifested her lack of faith by persuading Jacob to deceive his father. Jacob's course in this was not appropriated by God. Rebecca and Jacob should have waited for God to bring about his own purposes in his own way and in his own time. Instead of trying to bring about the foretold events by the aid of deception, if Esau had received the blessing of his father, which was bestowed upon the firstborn, his prosperity could have come from God alone, and he would have blessed him with prosperity and brought upon him adversity according to the course of action. If he should love and reverence God like righteous Abel, he would be accepted and blessed of God. If, like wicked Cain, he had no respect for God nor for his commandments, but followed his own corrupt course, he would not receive a blessing from God, but would be rejected of God, as was Cain. If Jacob's course should be righteous, if he should love and fear God, he would be blessed of God, and the prospering hand of God would be with him even if he did not obtain the blessing and privileges generally bestowed upon the firstborn. And I love that because that really is our lesson. Do we trust God? Do we trust him, his way, or do we look at it through the eyes of man and think that we need to help? So 
let us all look to God and his way and his timings, how he does it, so that the plans of men don't lead us to ruin as it did Jacob. I mean, you look at this. Even with Laban, what would have happened if Laban would have never deceived Jacob with Leah? He probably would have married Rachel and been like his father and had regular kids and not this functional mess. Let us always follow God and his plans as they unfold and let our lives grow and be guided by him and his will. And by believing that we may be faithful and righteous in his sight, because that's really what matters. In the end, the only person that's going to save you is in heaven above. And he died for us on the cross. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, you, you look upon us. Lord, we're a mess. Every single one of us here. And yet you sent your son to die for each and every one of us that we might have life in you. Guide us, Lord, in your truth that we may open our minds and our hearts to accept your spirit, that we may commune and dwell with the living God and the temple that is our body. Lord, and that your Shekinah glory may fill each and every one of us guiding us to your truth, casting out fear, Lord, and replacing it with that agape love that only you and you alone have. Teach us to surrender and to make you Lord of our lives, that we might have that slice of the kingdom of heaven here and now, and to be with you, Lord, for all eternity. Thank you, Lord, for your inexpressible love and for your sacrifice, and for counting us who are not worthy as so precious in your sight. We pray this to you, our Father in heaven, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen, Lord. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.